You're watching Gravitas. China continues its tirade against India after seemingly taking a softer position yesterday. Beijing is ratcheting up the rhetoric again. A government spokesperson has warned of utter chaos if their troops entered India and declared Delhi's stand on the Doklam standoff ridiculous and vicious. Here's more. First falsehood, then rhetoric, and now veiled threats. If we tolerate India's ridiculous logic, then anyone who dislikes the activity at his neighbor's home can break into neighbor's house. Does that mean when China thinks that large-scale construction of infrastructure at the border area of India is posing a threat, it can enter Indian territory? Wouldn't that be utter chaos? That was China's foreign ministry spokesperson, Huo Chenying, threatening India with little regard for rules or diplomatic engagement, making statements on hypothesis. I wouldn't describe the Chinese spokeswoman's uh, statement as a threat, but certainly there is a warning there that uh, China can do to India what India has done to China in uh, Doklam. Uh, the irony here is that uh, China and Bhutan have been negotiating over Doklam for uh, many, many years. Uh, in fact, there is also an understanding that uh, the status quo on Doklam Plateau will not be violated in any manner, which China, of course, violated by building that road. So um, there is enough uh, reason there for India to intervene. Also given the fact that India and Bhutan are tied together by a security, uh, security treaty which goes back many years. Uh, the treaty was renewed in 2007, uh, but the security um, understanding there is explicit and very clear. And in that sense, when Bhutan requested India for assistance to tackle the uh, Chinese road building activity, India stepped in. So there is an agreement between India and Bhutan. In that sense, legally, India is in the clear. Let's not forget, China's statement comes less than 24 hours after Indian Home Minister expressed willingness to talk on Doklam standoff. The BRICS summit, too, is scheduled to begin in less than two weeks. But China, which was first bullying Bhutan, is now training its guns on India. Ironically, it's the same China that could not once stop the Japanese from entering Shanghai and making more than 90 million Chinese refugees in their own country. Bureau Report, we on. With us from Beijing, two guests this evening, Atul Aneja, China correspondent for the Hindu, and Aina Tangan, political and economic commentator. Good evening to both of you. Atul, China has been blowing hot and cold. What do you make of the statement? And this one's coming not from a Global Times or a government mouthpiece, but from a government spokesperson. Well, I don't see how the situation has materially changed today uh, because China, uh, these are mind games which are being played, but the basic posi position of the Chinese remains the same, that India should vacate, that is, Indian troops should vacate uh, what they perceive as Chinese territory from the Doklam Plateau uh, for talks to begin. So. Quite honestly, we have seen uh, uh, this kind of uh, 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 rhetorical flourishes from from the Chinese, including their defense ministry and foreign ministry in the past. So frankly, there's not much. But I do find something interesting in Hua Chunying's statements, which is a reference to India's building of infrastructure in the in the border areas. I think that is that is an interesting point because. For my own investigation here, uh, it has become quite evident that the Chinese have been worried about what has been happening, especially the building of infrastructure, the raising of the mountain uh, strike core by India, the building of the of the uh, of the Dhola Sadia bridge. So, you know that comes out in that statement, which I find interesting. Otherwise, materially, the situation doesn't change by what uh, Hua Chunying has said. Uh, also, on the military side, I don't see any movement taking place, any true build-up uh, in, in Tibet, etc. So really, it's the status quo, which is essentially the bottom line. The sense is that nothing has changed. And these are mind games which have been played in the past, which continue to be played. Ainar, we've been discussing this for two months and counting now. And uh, you always say that war is in nobody's interest. I agree with you. Would you also say that the Chinese spokesperson today crossed, crossed the line when it comes to what is diplomatically acceptable? Well, I don't think so. It's basically what we've been discussing for quite some time. As I've told you, uh, 
the hypothetical I pose to you is if India, I mean, if China were to send troops into a disputed area between Pakistan and India, how would India react? What, it, you know, what is the substance? Mm. The Chinese ministry is simply trying to point out from a logical point of view, not a threat, just saying, look, if the situation were reversed, how would India feel? And he was saying it would be utter chaos. People in India would not accept the idea that Chinese troops were crossing an international border because they thought that something that was happening on the other side was against their strategic interest. In terms of the current situation, though, I would really like to know when it was that help was requested. Mm. I mean, no one has produced any memo saying when that was. The first that time that anybody knew internationally that uh, a request for assistance was made was on the 29th. That was, uh, a, you know, this started out on the 16th, escalated on the 18th. How is it that Bhutan only requested assistance on the 29th, but yet Indian troops crossed the border? So China's reacting to this and wondering what is the logic. They're desperate to try to get India to understand that China and India should get along, not fight. It is not in the best interests of these two countries. It is in the interest of the United States to have these two growing, prosperous countries going at each other and, and therefore allowing the domination of the U.S. That's an interesting angle. Atul and Asia, this comes just after Rajnath Singh's placatory statement. How do you expect India to respond and uh, what have you heard about Prime Minister Modi's participation or not in the upcoming BRICS summit? Well, it actually is funneling into the BRICS summit. I think that's where we got to look for, because uh, I do believe there are preparations which are going on for that visit. Now, what exactly are the expectations from the Indian side? It is not clear, especially for me sitting here in Beijing. But I do know that there are there are there are active the diplomatic activity between India and China has stepped up, and the next big moment which is coming up, and I don't see Prime Minister Modi not going there. Uh, unless uh, nothing comes out of these diplomatic exchanges which are going on right now, which is extremely unlikely. And in that context, I do see what uh, the Home Minister Rajnath Singh said yesterday mm. uh, or in the last couple of days. Uh, and so there is activity behind the scenes which is going on. Uh, uh, and, and we really got to see at the preparatory phase of, of the BRICS summit. And that is what is actually uh, interests me rather than uh, uh, back and forth and rhetoric which is coming from from both sides Ainar, from Ainar, both. okay i know very quickly what how serious a setback would prime minister modi's boycott of the BRICS summit be for china well it would be very very bad not only for china but for the rest of the BRICS. what you're doing is putting a a, a local regional matter above the uh, economics Right now, the world is suffering from the fact that the U.S. has withdrawn from TPP, TTIP, uh, almost every trade negotiation, global warming. These are all things that are the rest of the world thinks is very important. The question is, can India rise above this and say, look, we need to take a longer view. Mm. What is in India's best economic interests? Okay. Uh, we haven't heard the last of this, of course. Atul and Eja Ainar Tangan, thanks very much for joining us here on Gravitas. We are taking a break. Still ahead on the show, what a North Korean missile test says about China's problems with its neighbor. We'll come back to that.
years, thousands of Muslim women in India, especially those from poor families, have suffered in the name of instant triple talaq. While at least 22 countries across the world have done away with this archaic practice, even countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, in South Asia, today India's Supreme Court blocked the use of a Muslim divorce law until the government frames new legislation. Beyond Jessica Taneja has more. The Supreme Court's long-awaited verdict on triple talaq could be a turning point for gender justice and civil rights in India. It's a good judgment. It will go, it's a one step forward for gender justice and gender equality and it's good for women. Women's rights campaigners have hailed the court's decision as a historic win. The religious leadership are totally answerable for this kind of a malpractice and they should all join hands with the ordinary Muslim women and ordinary Muslim men in celebrating this verdict rather than continue to play their conservative patriarchal game because ordinary Muslims now have seen through this kind of a divisive and this kind of a, a one-sided and unjust practice. India is one of a handful of countries where a Muslim man can divorce his wife in minutes by saying the word talaq, meaning divorce, three times. Countries such as Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh and Turkey have banned the controversial practice. The government went slow. The Congress party was very, very conscious of the sensitivity of the issue and didn't want to create problems. So also, for instance, with tribal custom and tribal traditions, the constitution we have said they will be protected. And the religion and the practices of the minorities have been guaranteed in the constitution by the lawmakers themselves. And therefore, one must understand the perspective in which this issue didn't get really resolved. It's open to parliament to bring a law, right. make it clear, because this is a declaratory judgment. But uh, you must understand that uh, this was only on triple talaq. The one or two other practices like nikah halala and all that, mm -hmm. those have not been tested so far. But they said they will test it. They will, but that will it depend when. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe six months, maybe one year, maybe two years. Mm -hmm. So it may well be appropriate that parliament is bringing one law at, you know, simultaneously and deal with the, all the three uh, practices that we done with it. In India, where Muslims are a minority in a secular country, the matter was subject to heated political debate. There is so much politics around here. And don't forget, we believe here that we are the custodians of Islam. In fact, the very practice is un-Islamic. Triple talaq divorce has no mention in Sharia Islamic law or the Quran, even though the practice has existed for decades. Islamic scholars say the Quran clearly spells out how to divorce. It has to be spread over three months, allowing a couple time for reflection and reconciliation. The judgment is a huge victory for Muslim women. For decades, they have had to live with the threat of instant divorce dangling over their heads like a sword. Now, no more. Bureau Report, we on. And joining us uh, from Mumbai, Dr. Shama Mohammed. Uh, she is a political leader in India, and Meher Tarar, senior journalist from Lahore in Pakistan. Good evening to both of you. Shama, I want you to keep the politics aside for a moment. This is a landmark judgment. And whichever side of the divide you stand on, what does this mean for Muslim women in India and for the fight for gender equality? First and foremost, I must say it's a great day for Muslim women and women empowerment. A fantastic decision by the Supreme Court to abolish triple talaq, which is un-Islamic and unconstitutional. Let's give it to these. Uh, let me congratulate Bharat Mahila Muslim. Okay, we'll try and reconnect with the uh, uh, Mayor Tarar. Pakistan has done away with this practice and it's been a while now. Uh, so that puts a question mark on all those who criticize it, saying that this impinges on their right to religious freedom and so on. Uh, how do you see this verdict from the Indian Supreme Court? Uh, I think it's a wonderful. Any, any power in the world it's a, it's a historic moment for women in India as well as women anywhere in the world. Because one, it has nothing to do with Islam. Two, it simply shows that women are treated in a certain manner in particular such as yours and in ours. I, think I do 
that a lot, a lot of damage has been done by we but you know these intelligence in uh, uh, remember they saw once upon a time uh, uh, you know, people some other actor the uh, you know that are both and in my it was eager that Pakistan it's still uh, Pakistan I saw Okay, I'm going to apologize to our viewers for the poor connectivity there. We also have our own correspondent Maral uh, Golapur from uh, Tehran uh, in Iran. Maral, this is being hailed as a victory in, in the fight for gender equality here in India. Countries like Pakistan did away with something like this in 1961. There's also an element of, of politics, of course, uh, and appeasement and so on. Uh, how is it being seen in a country like Iran and uh, how do divorce laws work there? Uh, hello and good evening. Um, yes, in, uh, I was following the news in India and I noticed that there are certain similarities between the uh, Shia Muslims in uh, Shia Muslim minority society in India and here in Iran. So Iran is a Shia Muslim country and the divorce law in Iran is based on what is called Jafari Sharia law, which is some sort of school of thought for Shia Muslims. And uh, initially it was based on this law, but, but in 1967, a law called Family... Well, guess we'll we'll leave it at that. Uh, not very lucky with guests this evening and and network. Uh, Shama Mohammed Meher Tarar and uh, Maral, thank you all for joining us here. Uh, this is of course uh, the biggest story in India today.